The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Well, nice to have you back. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, ready to pick up with the third qualification of elders. Paul says that a man who would serve as an elder must be temperate. Your King James says vigilant. This is one of the qualifications in this third chapter that's not in Titus chapter 1. This word has to do with being self-controlled, level-headed. It's, word, it's a word that's only used in 1 Timothy and Titus. And it speaks to a quality that is expected from older men. Not just elders, but anyone who's elderly, any elderly man. Titus chapter 2, verse 2, Paul said that the older men be sober. That's this word. That they be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. If a man old enough to be an elder hasn't yet learned moderation and self-control in his conduct, he will be of little use in helping others acquire it, which would certainly be part of his job. And worse yet, he's going to be a risk factor when dealing with the many delicate situations that an elder has to confront and manage. An elder must be a man who is level-headed. He's going to be in situations where he will be the only one who is level-headed. And he's got to be a rock, self-controlled, level-headed. The next qualification Paul speaks to in my New King James is called sober-minded. This one appears in Titus chapter 1, verse 8 as well. And it's a similar to the word that we just dealt with, although it's got a few other ideas built into it. Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich, the premier lexicographers of our time, they say this, that this word pertains to being in control of oneself, and some synonyms for it are prudent, thoughtful, self-controlled. The New American Standard actually renders this word prudent. The ESV and NIV translate it as self-controlled. It, like the one before we were just looking at, is to be a quality of all Christian older men, Titus chapter, Titus chapter 2 verse 2, and of older women, Titus chapter 2 verse 5. He's thoughtful. He's self-controlled. He looks before he leaps. He's not hasty in decision-making. Sometimes he's going to be faced with decisions if he serves as an elder that are just so multifaceted, so complex, it just seems like there's almost no way to find your way out of them. He's got to be a man who will take time to work through these things, who will get advice if needed, who's not going to share information with others that shouldn't be shared, but who's going to get all the information he needs so he's not judging according to appearance, but he's judging with righteous judgment. And only upon careful, deliberate consideration then makes that important decision, whatever it might be. He's thoughtful, prudent, self-controlled, sober-minded. He's also a man of good behavior. This also is not mentioned in Titus. We mentioned this back in one of the other segments in chapter 2, verse 9. This very same Greek word, kosmios, is translated modest. There it was applied to women's clothing. Here it's used to describe this man's life. It pertains to having characteristics or qualities that evoke admiration or delight. It's an expression of high regard for persons. It could be translated respectable, honorable. The word also carries with it the idea of orderly. I think the idea is this. A man who is qualified to serve as an elder in the kingdom of God is a man who lives an orderly or disciplined life. He's not a slave to order. He's not a slave to routine. But there's predictability that typifies his life in the way he lives and in his habits. And this has allowed him to earn the respect and admiration of others. He's a man who can be depended on. He's a man who's predictable. One author by the name of John Phillips said this, A man who is always late for meetings, forgets appointments, breaks promises, 
is careless about his physical appearance and constantly misplaces important papers does not qualify for a leadership position in the church. And I think that's spot on. That's the sort of thing we're talking about here. God is a God of order. Everything he has made teaches us that. And the man who would serve as an elder has his life in order. He's an ordered man with an ordered life who can help bring some order to the church when it needs it. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, the next qualification we encounter is hospitable, or the King James says, given to hospitality. This Greek word is interesting. It's a compound word. In other words, it takes two Greek words, and they've been put together. We have a lot of words like that in our own English language. Uh, pineapple, butterfly, and some other words along those lines. And as is the case with pineapple and butterfly, you couldn't just take the meanings of those individual words and put them together and come up with the right meaning for the word. So it's a little dangerous to do that sort of thing. A word is generally more than the sum of its parts. But interestingly, if you did take the two Greek words that make up this single word, what you would get for a definition is a lover or a love of strangers, which is interesting. This man needs to have had a home that has not only been a place for entertaining his friends, but for practicing real hospitality, which means it's not only been available for friends, but if needed, even strangers. And in 21st century America, this can be a little frightening to think about, but with God as our stay, this is something we can do wisely. But it's something God expects. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 35, Jesus says to the righteous on the judgment day, I was a stranger and you took me in. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10, when the qualifications for a woman who is, can be supported by the church are given, it says she will have lodged strangers. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, we're told, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing some have enter, unwittingly entertained angels. The man who would serve as an elder must have been hospitable. That is, he is a model of Christian virtue in the sense that his home has been open. Because as an elder, his home's going to need to be open. There will be people who will need to come to his home. He'll need to be able to be available, to be spoken to and asked and addressed when the need arises. And that need may arise almost 24-7. He also according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, must be a man who is able to teach. Now, this qualification is not listed in Titus chapter 1, at least in so many words. Paul does say in Titus chapter 1, verse 9, that a man who would serve as an elder must be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who uh, contradict. So that certainly speaks to this idea of being able to teach, although it's not stated in so many words. He must be able to teach those gathered in the local congregation as well as those gathered around his table. He can teach publicly. He can teach privately. And if he's doing his job, he will probably at some point have a soul or some souls gathered around his table or some table. And the church is in desperate need of men who are able to do this. In fact, it's one of the greatest needs in the American church right now. Wise, well-read men who can not only teach the Lord's people basic biblical doctrine, but they can help people work through their problems in a biblical way. Problems running the gamut. Anger, lust, marital strife, depression, personality conflicts, OCD, anxiety issues. The list goes on and on as our society continues to degrade. The problems just keep growing. They've always been around, but they just seem to be growing perhaps in bigger numbers than in the past. It has been too often the response of even members of the church, even leaders in the church, when encountering things in people's lives to send them off to humanistic-based counseling for answers. We need to stop that. We need men in the role as shepherds who don't just automatically say, well, this is too big for me. I don't know the answer to this. Maybe you ought to go talk to a counselor. Sometimes that can be needed. Sometimes that has a place. But that should be something that is just not immediately turned to. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be 
thoroughly equipped for every good work and complete and perfect. All things have been given to us that pertain to life and godliness. This is a man who has some experience, who's been living the Christian life a while, as we're going to see a little bit later in the chapter. He's not a novice. He's learned how to apply the Bible to his life, the difficulties, the complexities of Christian life. And he can teach not only the doctrine, but how to put this into practice and, and deal with personal problems. And this ability, like all other skills, will not have been acquired overnight. The Bible is a library of books, and it takes years of diligent study to acquire a thorough working knowledge of its contents. Verse 3, Paul says an elder or a man who would serve as an elder must not be given to wine. This is repeated in Titus chapter 1, verse 7. That is, he is not to be addicted to wine. He's not a drunk. It's a call to moderation, not a call to total abstinence. As far as I can see, there is no prohibition in Scripture concerning a Christian consuming alcohol. I myself do not drink, have never been a drinker, but we do see in the Bible that Jesus consumed alcoholic drinks. Jesus' first sign in Cana of Galilee was making water blush, as it has been said. That is, converting water into wine. Jesus was slanderously called a wine-bibber. Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, there's no way in the world that could have even begun to stick if he himself had not been one who would drink wine sometimes. Now, granted, the wine they were drinking was not as potent as is much of the wine today. At least, that was true much of the time. But the Bible is not telling us that this man cannot consume wine at all. All that said... The Bible does indicate that wine and leadership are not natural companions, and I don't want us to miss this point. Proverbs chapter 31, beginning in verse 4, Solomon wrote this. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drink. Now Solomon himself may not have been the one to write that, but it was included in this book to which his name is attached. It is not for kings to drink wine, not for princes intoxicating drink. Notice in 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul had to tell Timothy to go ahead and consume a little wine for medicinal purposes. No longer drink wine only, said Paul. No longer drink only water, pardon me, but a little wine. So, although the Bible does allow, it appears to me, that for wine consumption, it completely removes addiction to wine and drunkenness as acceptable practices and furthermore teaches us that when, when, when in leadership positions wine is something that should be avoided as it does affect judgment. One other thing that should be taken into account appearance of evil. The culture's changing and I don't know how long what I'm about to say will be true but certainly in some circles it certainly is, it's, it's still true. When I was in college I roomed with a man who was not a Christian. And one day we were discussing Christians and alcohol, and I just asked him this question. I said, if you walked into this room and I had a beer in my hand, would you think I was a Christian? And this man, who was not a believer, looked at me and said, no. In his mind, Christians and alcohol did not go together. And that's not something we can ignore. No one will ever regret not drinking alcohol. The reverse of that may not be true. It is interesting to note that as soon as Paul says that an elder is not to be given to wine, he follows it up by saying an elder is not to be violent. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1 says, Strong drink is a brawler. Drink and fighting often go together. And so after telling him he's not to be drunken, he's not to be one given to wine, he mentions he's not to be violent. That is, he's not to be a pugnacious person. He's not to be a bully. The King James says he's not to be a striker, and that certainly is right. It's a peculiar state of things which calls out such an admonition to bishops, one author said, and I have to agree with that. But this certainly is a temptation for some men, even in matters of religion. My father told me a story many years ago in which one man from the church sat down with another man to have a Bible study. And as they sat down to have the Bible study, the man who was not a member of the church began to roll up his sleeves. And the member of the church asked him, 
why are you doing that? And the man is reputed to have said, well, I've never had a study with someone from the Church of Christ that didn't end in a fight. And as ridiculous as that may sound, I've heard other things like that. I've heard of situations not far from 100 years ago in which there was a debate taking place over matters of religion between people who were both so-called members of the Church of Christ and men having fistfights outside after the debate. No man who would serve as an elder can be a man who gives in to these kinds of impulses. False teachers liked to argue. They liked to dispute, as we've already discussed. But this needs to be a man who takes the high road when it comes to dealing with pugnacious and combative people. He does not return in kind, and he certainly is not a man who rolls up his sleeves for a good fist fight in the name of the Lord. He's a man who is a peacemaker. He's also not greedy for money. Some texts of the Greek omit this qualification. If you're reading from the NIV, it's not there. However, this word does appear in the majority text. It appears in the Textus Receptus, from which the King James and the New King James were translated, and so I do want to make sure I deal with it. He's not to be greedy for money. That is shamelessly greedy, avaricious, fond of dishonest gain. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, that an elder is to shepherd the flock of God, serving as an overseer, not by compulsion but willingly, and not for dishonest gain gain. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18 teaches us that in the early church, elders were sometimes financially supported. Here in 21st century America, that seems to be an unnecessary thing, as many men who serve as an elder are blessed with jobs that cover their needs, and when they're retired, money is available to them from other sources. But regardless of of our circumstances in this day and age or circumstances elsewhere at other times, it is biblically supportable for a man who's serving as an elder to be supported financially. But any man who desires to serve for that reason is not only not fit to be an elder, but he's no better than the false teachers. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, Paul said that these false teachers were men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. That's what's driving them. They're doing their th the things they are in the name of the Lord to gain money. No man who loves money is fit to be an elder. No man who would want to serve for money is fit to be an elder. Paul goes on to say, here in chapter 3, verse 3, that a man who would be an elder must be gentle. He doesn't include this qualification in Titus. He must be gentle. Quite a number of years ago, uh, there was a congregation that was having some struggles. And there was an evangelist who was helping this congregation. I was sitting at the breakfast table with a family in this congregation who'd seen all the trouble that had been taking place and was in the throes of the trouble at the time. And they said of this evangelist who was trying to help them, totally unprompted by me, one sister said of him, he's so gentle. He's so gentle. Somebody might say, well, gentleness, that's not my style. How can you be sure a point's ever going to get across if you're just always gentle? Well, there may be a time when something beyond gentleness is called for, but we can learn how we ought to go about things by looking at how God goes about things. And the Bible is very clear. God himself is gentle. In Psalm 18, verse 35, this is said by David. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. David said, I have come to where I am and I am what I am because God has been gentle to me along the way. Jesus was able to say of himself in Matthew eleven twenty nine, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. It was said of him in prophecy, Matthew twelve twenty, A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. A reed is a thin stem, and if it's bruised, it's just ready to break. But people who are like that reed, who are just at the point of breaking, of collapsing. Jesus was so gentle, he wouldn't be the one to push him over the edge. He wouldn't be the one to break him. Smoking flax, flax is what was used for the wicks in their lamps. If it's smoking, it's just about ready to go out. 
But Jesus was so gentle, he wouldn't be the breath to blow him out. This is how the Son of God was described. And think of how he talked to that Samaritan woman, a woman who'd been married five times and was now shacking up with somebody. What could Jesus have said? But what did he say? How did he treat her? How did he treat the woman caught in adultery when all these men humiliated her by bringing her into public and talking about stoning her? What would you do? What do you say? And the last words of Jesus to this woman were, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. God calls all Christians to be gentle. But a man who would be an elder must be a man who has cultivated and acquired this skill. He may be growing in it, but it's already a discernible part of who he is. Philippians 4, 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. He's a man who can restore someone who's overtaken in a fault in a spirit of gentleness. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. He's a man who is gentle because he's driven by humility. Titus chapter 3, verse 2. He is a man who sees himself for who he really is. And who of us, when we see ourselves for who we really are and who we've been, can be proud and harsh with someone who's sinning? There but for the grace of God go I. This is a man of gentleness. And commensurate with that, Paul follows it up by saying he's not quarrelsome. Again, we have a qualification here that's not mentioned in Titus. He's not a striker, and he's not an arguer. He's not like those false teachers. Chapter 1, verse 4. Chapter 6, verse 4. He's a peacemaker. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, and he's blessed for it. He's a man who's pursuing peace with all people and holiness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. And he's not covetous. Again, this particular qualification is not in Titus. He's not a lover of money, which we've already discussed. Not only does he not want to serve as an elder for money, but his mind's not on money and the things money buys. Remember when Jesus was speaking to the crowds in Luke chapter 12, and one of the men called out to Jesus, Luke chapter 12, verse 13, then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Here was the Son of God teaching on things concerning God, but this man's mind wasn't on God at all. He wanted the Son of God to stop teaching the truth and instead handle money affairs in his life. What was, all, what was motivating this man? Well, Jesus tells us. Jesus said to him, this is Luke 12, verse 14. Jesus said to him, man, who made me a judge and an arbitrator over you? And he turned to the crowd and said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. That's what was on this man's mind rather than Jesus himself or at least his teachings. Covetousness focuses a person's attention on things rather than on people, on this world rather than on the world to come. It's been said that there are two kinds of people. Those who love things and use people and those who love people and use things. And a man who would be an elder ought to be the latter. He's not covetous. And in verse 4, it says he has his children in submission with all reverence. This is similar to what is said in Titus chapter 1, verse 6, where it says he has faithful children who are not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Having his children in submission with all reverence. I don't believe that by children Paul means he must have had more than one. And I don't believe that because of Genesis chapter 21, verse 7. This was said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? For, Sarah said, I have borne him a son in his old age. By having a son, Sarah said she had borne children. A woman has had children. A man has had children, whether they've had one or 13 or 14. They've still had children. Furthermore, I don't think Paul is saying that the children must have been biological children. The point of this qualification is to see, can this man manage and train people? That's the question. And if he can manage and train his children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, he'll be able to do that in the kingdom of God with grown-up children. But Paul says he has them in submission with all reverence. This word means dignity, seriousness, holiness. 
I'd like to read to you this part of the verse from some other translations. The NAS reads, Keeping children under control with all dignity. The ESV, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. The NIV, however, reads, See that his children obey him with proper respect. And the NRSV says, Keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. If you were able to listen to those real carefully, you may have noticed that some translators apply the idea of reverence to the man himself, whereas others apply the reverence to the children. I don't know all the ins and outs of the Greek there, and even those who do are not agreed on it. What we can take away is this. This man must have proven himself to be a man who fathers respectably. And not only this, but his fathering commands the respect of his children. And no man's going to get that from his children unless he earns it. A father will not earn his children's respect by bullying them, by beating them, although spanking is a very biblical practice, but not by abusing them. He will not earn their respect by being wishy-washy, by being inconsistent, by being hypocritical, one of the things that has damaged a great many young people who were raised in homes where something was said at church, but it was not practiced at home. This is a man who practices what he believes. He's got that consistent and orderly life we talked about before. He is firm, but he's fair. And he clearly loves his children. And this kind of behavior has commanded their respect. And if he can accomplish that with his children who see him day in and day out, who've seen him in the best of times and the worst of times, he can accomplish it with the church. That's the kind of man, Paul says, we need in the eldership. And he says in verse 5, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? The family is God's testing ground. It's his training program. And as we were just saying, if he fails to successfully lead his own house, he'll not be able to lead God's house. But I want us to notice the expression Paul uses there. How will he be able to take care of the church of God? Now, he would be leading the church of God if he's an elder. He would be ruling in the church of God as an elder. These are all biblical ideas, but Paul highlights this idea of taking care of the church. This, the Greek word that's translated take care of, it's the very same word used of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10.34. I'll read that. Of the Good Samaritan, Jesus said this. So he went to him. He went to this man who'd been battered and beaten and left for dead. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. That's the word Paul uses of the work of the elder with respect to the church. He takes care of the church. I won't take time to read the following verses in this presentation, but in Ezekiel 34, verses 2 through 6, God describes what the leaders of the people were like in Ezekiel's day. They were fleecing the flock. They were treating the flock as just collateral, as a means to enrich themselves, using the flock for their own gain. In stark contrast to that, the man who would serve an elder as elder doesn't lord it over the flock with an iron fist, but he leads the flock and sacrificially goes out of his way for their gain, not his. As a father would tenderly take care of his own child, so this man will take care of the people of God. This is the heart of an elder. Verse 6, Paul says this man cannot be a novice. That literally means he cannot be newly planted, not newly planted in the Christian community. In other words, he's not a new convert. Because if he is, and he's appointed to the eldership, there's a very good chance he will become puffed up with pride. Being appointed to that high position at so early a stage will tempt him to be conceited, to think too highly of himself, more highly than he ought to think. And where does pride take us? Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall, and his fall if he becomes a proud man in the eldership, will be the same condemnation as the devil, which is, of course, hell. 
Matthew 25, 41, hell has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So as not to put a stumbling block even before the most gifted and good man, if he's a new convert, he's not qualified. He needs to get some experience and time under his belt before he's ready to serve as an elder. Finally, Paul says in verse 7, Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. He must have a good testimony. That is to say, he must have a good reputation. The apostles told the church at Jerusalem that the men they were going to appoint as deacons must be men with good reputations. Acts chapter 6 verse 3. Timothy, who served as an evangelist, was a man who had a good reputation. Acts chapter 16, verse 2. But in those instances, the, the emphasis seems to be on having a good reputation among those who are in the church. Here, Paul specifically states that this man must have a good reputation among those who are outside. That is, among unbelievers as well as believers. He's going to stand as a representative of the church to the world. And nothing could be worse for a local congregation than to have one of its leaders be a man with a bad reputation. Because how are people going to reason? They're going to reason, as leader, so flock. The world quickly spots a phony. Too often the problem has not been that people weren't watching, it's that they were. The, church quickly, the world quickly spots a phony, and a phony will give them an excuse to malign the church, stay away from the church locally, and uh, perhaps... Altogether. So not only does each member of the church need to be the real deal, but certainly the leaders need to be. If he's not the real deal, or if he's just got a bad reputation from past things, he may fall into reproach, says Paul. That is, into the reviling of other people, into disgrace. He'll be an object of insult in the eyes of the world. And that will bring, bring great damage to the church, and it will put him in a position where he's fallen into the snare of the devil. That expression, snare of the devil, it appears one other time in the Bible, and it's in Paul's second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.26, and it just literally means the devil's trap. We are not ignorant of the devil's schemes, so said Paul. Satan would like nothing more than to see one of the church's elders discovered to be a fraud by the world and thus prove that the church really is just a bunch of hypocrites. A man who would serve as an elder must be one with a good reputation, not only among Christians, but among those in the world. And this is why, as we draw this segment to a close, the evangelist who appoints elders must do his due diligence in learning who a man is before he appoints him to the office. Because if he appoints him and he's not the man he should be, it's going to have great bad consequences for the church and it will have negative consequences for the evangelist himself. Paul said, 1 Timothy 5.22, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. If an evangelist appoints a man who was not what he was supposed to be, not only will that man be guilty of sin, but the evangelist may be sharing in his sins by being the one who put him in that position. The evangelist has to be careful to make sure that the man appointed to the best of his ability is the man he's supposed to be. So concludes the qualifications of elders as recorded for us in 1 Timothy chapter 3. In our next segment, Lord willing, we'll pick up in verse 8 and cover the qualifications of deacons. Hope to see you then.